Hi there, my name is Dr Paul Murta. I am the Senior Project Officer at Archaeology Scotland uh, and I'm here today to talk about football archaeology and the benefits that football archaeology can bring to a wider public and communities. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for inviting me along uh, to present at the current archaeology uh, conference. It's a real honour. Uh, thanks very much for uh, all your support over the last few months as well in terms of our uh, coverage in the news. So, football archaeology. Before I go into that, I want to talk about uh, what Archaeology Scotland is. Many of you will, will have heard of us, of course. Some of you may have not. Archaeology Scotland, Archaeology Scotland was once part of the Council for British Archaeology. We were established in 1944. And we are the leading heritage charity working to inspire people to discover, explore, care for and enjoy Scotland's rich archaeological heritage. Uh, as I said, we were once part of the CBA, but they branched off uh, a few decades ago. and We have a really close relationship with them now. Uh, we are mainly supported through kind of grant income uh, to deliver a range of programmes throughout Scotland. But that is changing slightly, uh, and we hope to change that slightly over the next few years. One of our major projects is Adopt a Monument, which I'll briefly mention later. We have Attainment Through Archaeology, the New Audiences Project, which is a focus on what we're talking about today. Our Heritage Heroes Award, which is about working with school groups to engage uh, young people in their heritage. We run Scottish Archaeology Month in September. And of course, we have our excellent uh, journal, Discovering Excavation Scotland, which outlines all of the archaeology that happens in Scotland each year. We are a membership organisation, so if you're interested in supporting Scottish archaeology, uh, engaging with Scottish archaeology and helping support us deliver to our charitable aims to help communities engage with their archaeology, then please do consider joining us. Otherwise, it'd be great to have you uh, follow us on our various social media channels, uh, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and our website, which is going to be relaunched in the next few weeks. So what kind of work do we normally do? So as I mentioned, we have uh, our Adopt a Monument programme, which has been running for 30 years now, over 30 years. It's a programme where we, uh, we support communities who wish to undertake uh, uh, research, conservation, enhancement of their heritage. Community groups come to us and we help them explore different options about how to, to enhance their heritage or explore it or excavate it. Whatever they want to do, we help them with funding. And then we support them through training uh, and other kind of elements of support, uh, even if it's just a phone call sometimes. But certainly we love to get out with uh, our communities all over Scotland. It's been uh, changed slightly uh, in the last kind of round of, of projects. It's more than just looking after a site. We try to engage diverse audiences. And through that kind of strand of the new uh, of the Adopt a Monument uh, programme, we've been delivering pro, uh, projects with groups like Wom uh, Women at War and Digging the Scene, which works with uh, Crisis, uh, Bernardo's and other organisations uh, that help a range of different groups across Scotland. Uh, one of the ones we're, we're working on at the moment is Canal College, where we work with young people uh, to explore young people out of work in education to explore uh, the archaeology of the canals that's with uh, Keep Scotland Beautiful. So it's a, it's a, it's a program where we, we work specifically with young people to, to, to you know, explore their heritage and their archaeology and through that gain skills and employment. Out of that work we kind of realised that there was a, a way to engage different groups of, of people uh, that wouldn't traditionally be a, a, interested or engaged in archaeology and one way we thought we could do that was through football archaeology. Football is of course a global language, it's a language that billions uh, are aware of across the globe. It is a hook to get people interested in archaeology. So what is football archaeology? So football archaeology is an archaeology of sport, it's an archaeology of leisure. Now this kind of emerges out of a kind of the, the industrial archaeology kind of a uh, branch umbrella effectively uh, specifically football emerged uh, in the really as we know it in the mid 19th century uh, a period of, of obviously quite drastic industrial change social change as part of that 
leisure time becomes uh, kind of more established and people begin to play sports and they watch sports. But it's not really prominent in, in British or in certainly not Scottish archaeological studies until recently. The Scottish uh, archaeological research framework uh, is, a, is a, a broad uh, research framework in Scotland that covers different periods and different regions. And in the modern report uh, under the people in places theme, there is a one line about football archaeology. It is within a kind of the, the kind of the branch, of, as I said, of, of leisure, of, of kind of uh, industrial archaeology that is that's just not about the industry, but it's about kind of you know, what people did in their spare time. But but specifically, it says there is a great public interest and appreciation for this kind of heritage, which readily which is readily understandable and sometimes personally meaningful to many people. I find this slightly uh, uh, dismissive, shall we say, of, of, of this kind of heritage. A heritage that m is meaning to, meaningful for people is important, it is significant, and it's significant for study, research and investigation. Now, sports archaeology Football archaeology has a major emphasis in other fields, anthropology, sociology and history. Lots of books and journals dedicated to this, indeed entire departments at universities. And more importantly, I think it's really important for local histories and people's histories and club histories. If you look at any sports club in the country, and I'm, as I say, specifically talking about football here, you will see that his heritage and he history is so important to those clubs and there's a number of reasons why that might be, which I'll touch on a wee bit. But that idea that heritage and history is important to people, it's important to clubs and it's important to the identity of the people that support those clubs. As I say, it's not really recognised so much in Scotland uh, per se. Uh, there is a series of books called uh, uh, played in Britain, the Played in Britain series. Uh, there's a number of really interesting books about Played in London, Played in Manchester, Played in the Pub, and there's a really, really, really influential book called Played in Glasgow, which we take a huge amount of inspiration from by a chap called Jed O'Brien, who is the absolute uh, fount of all knowledge about sports heritage in Scotland and Glasgow, and particularly football as well. He is a man uh, dedicated to his field and if you ever get a chance to to speak to Jed or see Jed, Jed, Jed speak please do he is a, he is an amazing character and and a real inspiration to us and I want to say thank you at this stage to, to him uh, for for all his, his support but as I say so if you ever get a chance to see the played in uh, Britain series please do check it out it's very very interesting but a great resource and the played in Glasgow book is very very uh, influential and important as well so there's been some study, some you know authoritative study, and there are some buildings and places that are are recognised in the national monument records. Uh, this is the this the main uh, stand at Rangers Football Club, which is a B-listed uh, building designed by Archibald Leach. Archibald Leach was a famous engineer in the beginning of the 20th century who designed a number of sports stadiums around the country, uh, including Rangers, uh, but. There, and there's very few examples of his work left. Everton uh, Stadium is one, Fulham uh, as well. So there's a number of, of quite rare examples of his work now, but he really kind of, he was the kind of main designer of football stadiums, sports stadiums in Britain for, for you know, the, the, the major part of the 20th century. So he's really important. So th things are, are recognised to a certain extent, but there isn't a huge amount. In terms of the archaeology of football stadia or football, not much had really been done in Scotland uh, until our recent excavations. We had to look uh, to, to England really to, to find inspiration uh, for this. There were, there's been two really major uh, excavations that, uh, that we, we, draw, we have drawn on for our inspiration and our work. Uh, one was at Peel Park at Accrington Stanley. It was excavated by U Clan in 2011. And this was very much a community focused project, uh, working with the club that's currently there, but also working with the school and the local community. And there they excavated different elements of this former ground and they found different elements of the, the stadium. And also interestingly, they tried to 
think about the different artifacts that they found and how that might reflect on the way that different types and groups of people would have spectated and, and watched the game. Uh, you can look at uh, their report in the World Archaeology, Volume 44, uh, from uh, June 2012. Uh, and there's a number of videos uh, online as well. It's, it's really interesting. A slightly different approach was taken by Jason Woods uh, when he excavated Bradford Park Avenue Stadium uh, in the 2013 and 20, 2015. Jason Wood worked with artists to explore the archaeology of this, this former ground. You can see here that this is the picture of the excavations taking place. You can see groups of fans milling about in the former uh, stands. Interestingly, Jason found the first uh, ever excavation of a goalpost. This upright ranging rod here is where the goalpost was. This was about engagement with the community as well, and it was really crucial to engage with the community. Jason describes how he found a line of coins in a kind of strange U-shape around what the goalpost would have been. Now, this might be disgruntled fans throwing coins at players if things are going badly or indeed well for the opposing team. But what he discovered was when uh, working with local volunteers that they said, actually, this is when a big blanket was taken around uh, at half time and people would throw coins into the blanket and gather up money for charity. And these are coins that hit the net and fell down around the outside of the, the goalpost, around the net. So this is a kind of ephemeral uh, record of this, this, this goal, a goal that, that would have seen you know, so much joy and pain and excitement. This is a kind of a really visceral archaeology. And for the people that Jason worked with in the background there, this is an amazing experience to, to visit their ground once again. So we were inspired by these, these two projects in particular. And we talked with both of the uh, excavators uh, before we kind of started our work as well to, to gain some really uh, excellent information and, and help us design our project. Looking at the way the Scottish evidence has been really recorded over the last few years, I just want to touch on this briefly and, and describe how it's changed recently. There's been very little archaeology done on football stadiums in Scotland, uh, and, and, and quite sporadically as well. Uh, the picture on the left there is uh, the uh, Parkhead Celtics uh, ground before it was redeveloped in the late uh, in, in the early 90s. The Royal Commission of Ancient Historic Monuments at, at the time uh, took undertook a very basic photographic survey of the ground before it was redeveloped, and that was a, a really it's a really valuable resource and one that you know many fans uh, see it, see as being being important. It records the ground just just at that cusp of change. But that was sporadic. Not all grounds were recorded in that way, uh, and many were lost forever without have a pro having a proper record. This changed uh, in the late 90s. A group of uh, archaeologists at the Commission who were interested in football and interested in aerial photography realised that as they were going off to record you know, crop mark sites and other monuments throughout the landscape, they were flying over these football stadiums. Being football fans themselves decided to start taking some photographs. This is uh, the, the picture in the middle there is uh, New Douglas Park, which is the Hamilton Academicals Stadium. One of the archaeologists was obviously a big fan of Hamilton. Uh, and we actually have a very good record of uh, football stadiums just at the turn of the, the millennia, uh, you know, which, which are useful resource. But again, it was quite sporadic and kind of off the cuff in effect. This has changed quite dramatically in the last five years, maybe, where grounds are recognised as being really important uh, historical and social places for communities and that those grounds and stadiums that are going to be lost or redeveloped have been quite accurately and meticulously recorded. This is a ground built in the 1930s, Rob Roy Royson, uh, which had a full photographic survey of it. Uh, I know the, 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 the surveyors now at Historic Environment Scotland uh, regularly go out and record these types of grounds, most, re most recently Somerset Park, uh, 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 United's grounds, uh, where they recorded it during a game 
uh, at night time to, to capture the, the kind of essence of the football taking place, something which I'll touch on in a minute. Because why is football archaeology important? It's, a, it's an archaeology that's not really been recognised as such as being important over the last you know, few years, as, as I've touched on. But football grounds have been a major part of Scotland's and indeed you know, the UK's, Britain's uh, and, and Europe's social and cultural fabric for over 150 years. It is the most important cultural uh, phenomenon of the last 150 years. 3.5 billion people now play football. Uh, and it developed at a time of major social change as well. So the idea of examining and studying the fabric of that, these places, helps us understand the way people live their lives uh, in the late 19th, early 20th, and indeed up to the, the present. And I think that's incredibly important. But they also offer us unique insights about recent and contemporary past. They offer us uh, places and they are places, receptacles of tangible and intangible heritage. Those of you who, who go to, to football or any sport know as you walk up to a ground the, the smells, the sounds, the singing, all of the kind of culture around it, the scarves, the colour, it's all linked in with these places. It happens in these places. These are places where people come together, they assemble, maybe only for 90 minutes, but it's a regular, regular ritual assemblage in these places that, that creates, creates a sense of place, a topophilia, a, a, the love or emotional connections with a place or physical environment. These are important places for people. People scatter people's ashes there, people get married there. The joy that is experienced at these grounds, at sports places, is, is undescribable. The pain is also undescribable. As a Scotland fan, I know that all too well. But of course, they also allow us to examine other elements of heritage, working class history and heritage, often not uh, recorded or, or um, explored. The development of leisure, as I've said, over the last 150 years, but also darker elements to do with violence, to do with sectarianism, especially from places like Glasgow, which I'm all too familiar with, but also identity and community as well. So there's positivity there as well. So they're really, really important places. And I think we can engage diverse and new audiences in archaeology and heritage. People who wouldn't normally get really interested in archaeology <clears throat> are interested in the her heritage of their, their stadiums. But as I said, they are, they are uh, uh, football is a global, uh, a global language. It allows us to connect throughout the world, which is increasingly important, I think. For us, more specifically and more practically, it helps us to deliver Scotland's archaeology strategy and our place and time, Scotland's strategy for the historic environment. It allows us to reach these, these outcomes, which are bigger outcomes for the Scottish uh, archaeology and heritage sector. So, how did we <clears throat> approach football archaeology? We designed a project back in uh, 2017 called Playing the Past. So Playing the Past was a, a, a programme, a project which aims to encourage people to explore, engage Scotland's rich sporting heritage and to get them to understand the connection between sport and heritage, something hadn't really been done in Scotland before. We excavated two uh, grounds. Uh, the first was at St Bernard's FC ground, the Royal Gymnasium or the Jimmy, which is in Stockbridge or was in Stockbridge in Edinburgh. Now that is the, the image uh, in the slide is of that, that ground. None of it survives. It's, we didn't find any evidence of that, but oh, that almost all wasn't the point. We wanted to, it was a kind of evaluation, but we worked with a number of, of, of people uh, from fun rural backgrounds, including drug and alcohol, uh, with drug and alcohol issues, and it was a real interesting engagement uh, project. One we had much more success with, 
and you'll see why in a minute, was uh, our excavations at Cathkin Park in Glasgow, which was the second Hamden Park and in fact the second Cathkin Park. It was the home to Queen's Park initially and then latterly uh, Third Lanark FC. So this was the second Hamden Park. There has been three Hamden Parks. Uh, there's the current one where Scotland currently play, the second Hamden Park and the first Hamden Park, which we'll concentrate on in a minute. Uh, that was a focus for our, our archaeological investigations this summer. Uh, it, the second Hamden Park was built in 1884 and was there, only there until 1903. It went through a number of phases of uh, the development as, as football became more popular. It was then sold to Third Lanark because uh, Queen's Park decided to move uh, grounds again because they realised they needed a bigger stadium. And they sold it to Third Lanark. Third Lanark were, were needing another grounds. They mo moved just a few hundred uh, metres uh, really uh, from the north of Gla further north in Glasgow to this ground and they redeveloped it. Uh, you can see in the maps here on the left hand side, uh, this is the layout of the second Hamden Park. You can see the pavilion in the corner here and then the grandstand with the, the terracing around the outside. When they sold it to Third Lanark, for reasons I'm not too sure about in the moment, though I'd like to do some more research, they demolished it all. They leveled the, they leveled the, 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 the grandstands and the, the stadium and Third Lanark had to build it entirely new one and they switched it around. They, they kind of turned it slightly uh, with the grandstand on the north side here. This is the north of Glasgow. The city centre is in, in, in that direction with, and the pavilion here. Importantly, just uh, recognise that because this is where our excavations took place. Before I move on to the next slide, I just want to point out this area here. This is the area of the first Hamden Park, which we'll, we'll touch on uh, later in the talk. <clears throat> Third Lanark, for those of you who don't know, were one of Scotland's oldest teams. They were a founding member of the Scottish uh, Football Association. They won the Scottish Cup on numerous occasions. They were a big team. They were Glasgow's third team with uh, Celtic Rangers, Third Lanark, was Partick Thistle and Queen's Park, but Third Lanark were a major team. They emerged out of the Lanarkshire uh, Rifle Volunteers. They were a military organisation that realised that football was a way to, to practice skills and teamwork and they became a, ma a major force in Scottish football. They wore red, a red kit which reflected their, their military background. They were a very sad demise. In 1967, a year of monumental success for Scottish football with Celtic winning the European Cup, Rangers getting into the, the final of the Cup Winners' Cup, Kilmarnock getting the semi-final of the fair, uh, the Ferris Cup, uh, Scotland being England at, at Wembley the year after they won the World Cup. Major success for Scottish football. In the same year, one of their major teams went bust in 1967. So this is the, an image of Cathkin Park just as it went bust. You can see the, the bushes starting to encroach on the ground. The pavilion there in the corner, which was our focus for excavations, and the ground still, still in relatively good nick. This is it today. It is a remarkable monument to the mid 20th century. It's the fact that it survives at all is, is remarkable. You can see here the terracing uh, still survives, the concrete terracing and these red gold crush barriers, which local people paint. It's a place of pilgrimage for Thurlanic fans, but fans of, of Scottish and football archeology span and heritage. <clears throat> It is a, a very emotive place. It's ghostly. It is, it is, uh, it's, it's like entering a, a kind of abandoned cathedral. It's a really amazing uh, piece of uh, archaeology. But this is it in 1972. So just a few years after uh, it was abandoned, you can see the pavilion falling into ruin, the pitch you know, quite badly degraded. In 2017, we decided we'd like to investigate the site. Uh, we did some geophysics. Uh, this is an image of the magnetometry. Uh, you can see here a lot of noise, really, which is where the demolished grandstand was. But interesting, you can actually see 
the outline of the pitch, which is maybe clearer here. There's also a running track that went round the outside of the pitch. And interestingly, I'd like to draw your attention to these quite high resistance anomalies, which we have interpreted as being the foundations of the goalposts. Note the different phases. We're not entirely sure which phase matches which. One would have been the second Hamden, so where Queen's Park would have played. The other ones would have been the second Cathkin, where third Lanark would have played. In the summer, this summer, 2022, we hope to in investigate these features to see if we can work out some phasing. This is a plan uh, of, the, of the stadium in the 1960s, and this is where we concentrated our excavations in 2017. Really small scale uh, investigations. We had some uh, funding through HLF, and we worked with uh, volunteers, uh, volunteers from uh, the uh, ex servicemen's associations. Uh, we also worked with the current Third Lanark supporters. There is a juniors team and there's indeed fans from the original team. There's a chap here wearing the red and white uh, training kit of the current Third Lanark. As I said, our trenches were quite small. We encountered uh, what we think is foundation material for the pavilion. And interestingly, we found a number of fragments of red and white china, the red and white of Third Lanark. So these, this, these bits of china are the actual cups that the players and the officials would have used. It's a remarkable find. And of course, the fans were delighted by this. They all wanted to take bits of it home. Loads of people came down and asked for bricks. Can we get a brick? Can we get a brick of this pavilion? It was a really important place for a number of, of people. While we were there in 2017, a guy came over called Graham Brown and he said, you're digging in the wrong place. Hamden is over there, referring to the first Hamden Park. Now, we thought he was a bit mad. Uh, you know, everyone knew that the first hand had been lost forever and was never to be discovered again. But this guy, Graham Brown, was convinced that we were in the wrong place and the first Hamden was in a different area. But he had some uh, background to this. It wasn't just out of the blue. Cathkin Park is in the trees in the distance there. That's where Cathkin Park currently is. This is Hamden Bowling Club. Hamden Bowling Club named because it was on the site of the first Hamden Park. Now, this was a myth that perpetuated in the bowling club itself and no one really believed them, really. But working with Graham for a number of years uh, and Graham's dedication uh, to this idea, he pursued this research. Now this is an image of, and in fact the only photograph we have of the first Hamden Park. This is the Hamden Park Pavilion with the players and officials and the pitch in front of us there. Hamden Park, the first Hamden Park, is the first purpose-built international football stadium in the world. It was built in 1873. It was built the year after the first international football match between, which took place between England and Scotland. And it took place in Glasgow at the West of Scotland cricket ground. Now, all the players that played for Scotland in that game all came from Queen's Park, the Queen's Park team. They were known as the, the Scottish professors. They had a very different game compared to the, to the English players. In Scotland, there was a it was a it was regarded as a passing and running game. The idea was that you pass to a player, and they would pass you back, and you dribble it, pass it up the pitch, and score a goal. The English players played a different type of game. They played a kind of a, you know in terms of formations, it would be a a, a, a you know a one nine one. You know it was a, a almost more like a rugby formation, uh, and the, the players would would get the ball and run with it until they were tackled, and then someone else would take it and run with it and tackle. So the idea that the Scot Scotland would pass it around uh, meant that they, they defeated England on numerous occasions uh, with this the technique. And this is the technique that then was developed and taken on board by the rest of Britain and then the rest of the world. So the passing game 
kind of emerged out of this ground. The, 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 the game that we know today emerged really from these players and from this stadium. So it was built in 1873, the year after the first international. Again, we weren't really sure if if, if Graham, you know, if this was, was the site. But he was convinced and the community were, were convinced. And there's this remarkable uh, mural that's on the back of the Hand and Bowling Club just now. Excuse the score for those of you who are from down south. Scotland 5, England 1. One of the biggest defeats ever in 1882. Interestingly, uh, the first uh, black football player that ever played uh, professionally and was indeed the uh, captain of Scotland played for uh, Scotland on this ground. Now, as I said, we weren't sure exactly uh, if this was the right location because no map had ever been discovered or recorded of the ground. It was built in 1873 and was demolished in uh, 1883. So it was built after the first edition or survey map was created and was demolished before the second Ordnance Edition map was created. So it was this gap in the middle where it wasn't mapped at all. But Graham being Graham, he was dedicated to, to finding this. He realised that the reason, I should say, that it was moved because, because a railway line was, was put through the ground. And Graham realised there must be some engineering maps related to this, you know, to this engineering work. So he wrote off to the National Archives in Edinburgh asking if there was any maps related to the to the to the, to the railway in that area and lo and behold he got this image back this is a map of the first Handon Park first international football ground in the world <clears throat> this is the pavilion which the photograph had shown and here's the ground with a grandstand to the south. So this is the north up here where the city centre is, and this is the south down here. A remarkable discovery, and one that allowed us to start thinking about what if some of this archaeology survives. So last year, just before the Euros, the week before Scotland men's team, they made it to their first major tournament in 23 years, we decided we would do some archaeology. So you can see here the blue uh, outline is the uh, <coughs> superimposed map onto the current Ornus Survey map. And we decided we'd try and look for the pavilion in this area and the outer part of the, the stadium and potentially the, the grandstand on this side. We did some geophysics uh, with uh, Rose Archaeology from Orkney. This map here, this, this block here is the, the bowling green itself. Unfortunately, we weren't allowed to dig in the Bowling Green. I think we'd have gone into quite a lot of trouble. Uh, but we managed to do some interesting ground penetrating radar and resistivity. And there was a number, number of anomalies in here, which may be related to the, the ground uh, or, or, or indeed actually earlier features. This was a, a farm landscape uh, before the stadium was built. And I should say, nothing has been built on this area since the stadium was demolished. Remarkably, th this wee corner of Glasgow wasn't developed there was a lot of tenements and buildings around it but the bowling green was put in quite early and this bit here is a garden so there's a, a nice park here so you know it survived kind of you know really fortuitously the geophysic in this area and the garden itself revealed a number of anomalies there's a blob technical term here and a couple of linear features as well so you can see just the interpretation here. Now, what this blob is, we and this, this this linear feature is, we think that actually we've probably superimposed the map in a slightly slightly wrong way. We think it's probably shifted maybe about five meters or so to the south. And if that is the case, then this blob matches up quite nicely with the pavilion, and this line here matches up quite nicely with the boundary wall. So we targeted those two areas for excavation, and we targeted this kind of strange double anomaly as well. So this is the trench of the double anomaly. Interestingly, across the site, we came down onto a surface 
of, of bricks, half bricks on end across the site. This caused a lot of uh, kind of confusion and we didn't really know what was going on. But with some research, we discovered that this was in fact a tennis court before it became a garden. So we think we may have some drainage material from the uh, foundations of tennis courts, so the archaeology of tennis courts. Again, not something we know much about and something we'll have to do a bit of research on to really kind of discover uh, you know, what kind of archaeology we have here. But this was, a, was across the site below these bricks. I don't have a good photograph of it, where the two linear features which we discovered and those two linear features were drains, uh, 19th century drains, which were cut into you know, clay pipe drains, which were cut into the original ground surface which we have interpreted as being the original ground surface of the, the football pitch. It could be part of the farm that was there before, but it seemed like a very engineered kind of piece of work. So we think it might be drainage for the football pitch. Again, in our other trench with the other linear feature, this very strange brick surface, uh, which we've interpreted as being the tennis court archaeology, and below that, we have a foundation cut of what we think is a wall uh, running in a linear direction, which we think is the, the outer edge of the ground itself. In the trench where we had the large blob, the anomaly, we came down onto what we think is foundation material or demolition material related to the pavilion. A number of stones and bricks uh, in the right location uh, detected by the geophysics, which we were arguing is, is probably the foundations of the pavilion, the first purpose built sports uh, building in the world. Interestingly, if you can see, there's this black uh, loamy material, and in that were a number of artifacts of mid 19th century date. So clay pipes, glass bottles for juice and beer, fine china and slates probably from the roof of the pavilion and interesting lots of bits of wire which we've interpreted as being the wire that might went, have went around the outside of the pitch. So you can imagine the players and the fans standing watching the game, holding on to this wire, which we think we may have found, drinking beer, smoking pipes, cheering on Scotland and Queen's Park. So not much really has changed in terms of the way people support and look at football, but it's a real tangible connection with these earlier pioneering footballers. So as I said, a big part of this project really for us was the archaeology, of course, very exciting, first uh, purpose-built international football stadium in the world. But importantly, it was a way for us to engage with different and new audiences. Our funding for this project came from uh, Historic Environment Scotland and it was part of our new audience programme. This programme has been designed designed to open up opportunities for marginalised and displaced people to get involved in archaeology, to get them a chance to connect with other people and explore their new locations. So the main, as I say, the main focus for this has been First Hamden. It is a hook to get people involved in archaeology. It is a universal language. It brings people together. And importantly, especially after Covid, it improves well-being for people who may be socially isolated. But there's specifically, we wanted to work with refugees and asylum seekers. So we help them in a number of ways through things like placemaking. So the idea of coming into a new location and getting to know their city and simple things like practicing their English. We had volunteers from 11 different countries. Uh, they were referred to us through different organisations. Uh, the Southeast 
uh, integration network based in Glasgow, the Scottish Refugee Council, for instance, uh, Pashto, which is a language cafe. So people were referred to us. We were we were offered opportunities to these groups, and we said, you know, we have opportunities for your your your, uh, your service users to come and, and help us get some archaeology skills, but more importantly, make friends, you know, get involved in the community. We provided lunches for people. Importantly, we provided uh, things like bus passes for people. People who are refugees and asylum seekers have, have very, very little money, if at all. They've been living in hotels for the last year or so. So the idea was we were able to support them to come to the place to help them, help them dig. We also worked with people uh, from Glasgow who had uh, health issues and social isolation issues. And it was a real amazing uh, experience to have people from Glasgow uh, and people from Vietnam working together on the same site and making friends. Because of this work, we had a, a range of impacts for people. So, as I said, some people have been living in hotels for over seven months or, or more now. So they were able to meet people, gain new experiences, try something new and make friends. They're able to think about and learn more about the archaeology and history of the places, their new places where, where they live, in Glasgow in particular in this instance. They were able to learn English and Glaswegian, which was beneficial and indeed quite funny a lot of the time. And one of our participants uh, was able to uh, get a full time place in college, which is not normally open to asylum seekers. So there was a range of outcomes and benefits for our participants. We're going to do some proper evaluation on this over the next few months, and we hope to do more work with these groups in the future. And we have secured funding from Historic Environment Scotland to do more uh, of our new audience project over the next three years. I'd like to finish with a video, or at least try to play a video, uh, of our project. From the first kind of five minutes, everybody got on so well. You know, it's been a brilliant kind of atmosphere. Everybody just gets stuck in as well. You know, and was having a laugh when they were doing it and chatting away. <laughs> <laughs> It shows best bits of, of archaeology and heritage projects, doesn't it? And it shows shows you how kind of how unique these kind of projects are and bringing folk together. To see it, feel it, touch it, and there's a story behind it. It's just incredible. Well done, James. Now well, find the rest of it then. I am from Vietnam. I come to Glasgow for applying asylum seeker in Glasgow. I have been in Glasgow for five months. I came to volunteer at the first Hamden Park because I love football. I have opportunity to speak with people. I have opportunity to improve my English. So that's a great opportunity for me to get communicate with people in Glasgow. What made us want to do this is there are things here that are of importance to, to kind of Scotland more generally and to our history and you know, we'd like to be involved in, in helping discover that. I think it's quite interesting. I'm not a football fan, but, but you know, just the fact that I got to dig something up, it's, it's such an amazing... I feel like I'm in an Indiana movie, Indiana Jones movie. You cut that, right? Yeah, you're good. <laughs> We've had uh, about 11 different nationalities involved in the dig, and it was really heartening to kind of hear why people were wanting to volunteer and why they were really keen. Maybe not so interested in football, but really interested in, in Glasgow and finding out about the, their new home. And I think that really kind of epitomises Glasgow and epitomises football and, as well, obviously, you know, kind of bringing people together. Um, and it's a big part of what we what we do as Archaeology Scotland, so it's, it's been fantastic. So I hope 
you agree that that video really captures kind of the, the energy and the excitement that we had on site last year. Uh, I'd just like to finish by saying thank you very much to all the volunteers uh, and the organisations that helped us uh, you know, deliver the project, the South East Integration Network, the Scottish Refugee Council for New Scots. Uh, thanks, as I said, to the, all the volunteers from all over the world that came out and helped us on the excavations. Special thanks to Eric Gardner, who in their first phase of excavations, uh, we could not have done it without him, especially in the last day, he shifted, shifted a, a proper tonne of earth. Uh, thank you so much to our, our funders, Historic Environment Scotland, and thank you very much to uh, the members of the Hand and Bowling Club, and uh, especially Graeme Brown, uh, who was a, a constant source of encouragement and uh, you know, dedication. So thank you very much. Thank you again to Current Archaeology for allowing us to present uh, our project. And if you'd like to know more about the project or have any questions, please contact us through our website and you'll find our, all our contact details there. So uh, thank you very much.